Hello, good evening everyone. Seven PM we start with the new session today, that is uh, a revise revise session, that is a quick revise session. We'll we'll do the head and neck part today. Session today that So do we have, we have um, Sanjeev, any more to join? Right, so now quickly, just to give you a introduction of uh, exactly who I am, I'm Dr. Roini Wine, and uh, I teach anatomy at this platform, An Academy. Okay, today we are going to do some rev revision of the head and neck. We'll start with the, what are the topics that, uh, or what are the timings that I stick to. First is special class every morning at 8 a.m. That is one gross anatomy topic is what I discuss every morning at 8 a.m. And then every evening hours, that is at 7 p.m., I discuss one gross anatomy topic. It could be revision of what is already taught, just like we are doing today of the head and neck. And then at 10 p.m. we have a quiz. It's called quiz up. And this will be the clinical anatomy part or it could be the gross anatomy questions. MCQ. So it could be that or it could be completely you know, the questions that is related to the topic that has been covered. Now we have some things that is coming up that is plus classes that is on 19th and 20th that is Saturday, Sunday, 26th, 27th and then on 29th that is on Tuesday. So this is the month of June. So this is the agenda I have for June month. So now you also know that there are various uh, uh, classes that is happening. You can uh, go for subscription of the iconic Need PG subscription. That is, if you go for 36 months of subscription, you have a good price slash that is from 92,000 to 58,500. Similarly, 24 months is 49,500 now. It was 77 before. Now it is 49,500. And then 18 months, if you go for 66,000 was before and now it is reduced to 45. So you are getting more than 10% of discount provided you use the code. That is, you can use my name here. This is the code. This is the promo code that you can use. And uh, this is limited time offer for the first 500 students only. So you can avail this. And then to think if you are already, you know, well versed with the subject and you just need a brush up and you need a revision, you can also go for three months subscription and you will also get one month free. So altogether you get four months and this one month free will be added to the three months within 30 days of your subscription. So this is a nice offer if you don't have time. If you have time and you want to go for a year-long subscription, you'll get two months free altogether, 14 months of endless access to Prep Ladder and an Academy platforms, both of them. And uh, you have so many educators like all the various subjects, like all the subjects you have good educators, and they would do the doubt clearing sessions, PDF notes can be downloaded and also recorded sessions can be accessed. All this is possible and with your convenience, that is evening hours. So evening hours you have, it has started from June and um, this goes on for a month long session. So you can check out this. And also if you don't have learners app, you can download from the app store or the Google store and then go for the NEAT PG 
section where you can see your favorite educators. You can subscribe to their classes and also follow them. So once you start following them, you will get a lot of notifications about the classes. So you will be on board. You will be on board for the completion of this course and then you will be better prepared for your NEET PG exams. And then when you go for all these plus iconic subscriptions, you have this 36 months of you know, package, which is at the EMI rate of 1250 only. So if you take minimum of six months, you can go for such subscriptions. So minimum of six months is a must to go for an EMI um, option that is no cost EMI available at this package. So you can use the code ROHINI to avail the discounts. This is the must. And you have, uh, once you have the subscription, you have the access to the best of an academy on, and also the best of prep ladder, where you have live classes, batches, videos, and tests and quizzes, everything. Everything you can look for to prepare for your NEET PG exams. So you can go have a look at this. So now let's quickly go for, we have decided that is the, the green arrow indicates the Kripli form plate. Where is this present? This is present in the ethmoid bone. This part of the ethmoid bone, not the frontal bone. That is one thing. So, cribriform plate allows the olfactory nerves to pass through it. Next, you have the optic canal that you can see. Optic canal, what structure pass, passes through it? Optic canal, you have optic nerve and ophthalmic artery. Okay. Next, you have superior orbital fissure. You have the structures that supply the eye. So you have the cranial nerves that is oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic and trigeminal. All these nerves, they pass through the superior orbital fissure. So there is a tendinous ring as well. So where you can see uh, outside the tendinous ring, there is optic canal. So optic canal passes these two structures and within the tendinous ring also certain things pass. One of the important thing that passes through the tendinous ring is the abducent nerve. Abducent nerve and also the oculomotor division. So this is something you must remember what structures pass through superior orbital tissue. So we can just quickly draw this and show you. So that is the tendinous ring. You remember here L, F, T and then you can see abducent, nasociliary and oculomotor and then here there is the inferior orbital fissure and here there is optic canal, optic nerve and ophthalmic artery. This is this is the abducent and here you, you have this uh, nasociliary and these are the divisions of oculomotor. Oculomotor divisions. And here what you have is the optic canal. So, and the structures are here. Okay. So, this is what passes through that. What is L? Lacrimal, frontal and trochlear. Next, you have this rotundum. ROS, the ROS, there are three of them. There is rotundum, there is ovale, and you have the last one that is spinosum. So you have rotundum, maxillary, you have ovale, M-A-L-E. One of them is mandibular nerve, accessory meningeal artery, lesser petrosal nerve, and MEC vein. Okay, so now mandibular nerve, passes through the foramen ovale and there is this meningeal branch 
mandibular nerve passes through spinosum. This is the spinosum. And there is one more thing that passes through the spinosum that is middle meningeal artery. This is one important thing you must remember. Then there is internal acoustic meatus that is at the petrous part of the temporal bone. So now here there is a bumpy structure also that is known as the trigeminal cave you can see and then here you can see there is a line that is for greater petrosal nerve. This groove is for greater petrosal on the top. And then here you can see the 7th and 8th cranial nerves. Okay, so 7th and 8th cranial nerves is present passing into the internal acoustic meatus. Once they are, you know, exit out from the pons, they are, where, where, where are they attached? It is attached or they originate from the pons. And uh, 7th and 8th cranial now course is pretty much same until the petrous temporal bone, petrous part of the temporal bone. Later on, the vestibulocochlear nerve stays back and it stops there because it is a sensory. And the facial nerve has extracranial cords. Okay, next one, jugular foramen. And this is divided into three parts. The middle part, what I have shaded here, will have this. Tenth, that is eleventh and ninth cranial nerves. Ninth, tenth, and eleventh cranial nerves. And last but not the least, you have this small foramen in front of the foramen magnum. This is foramen magnum, and this is known as higher sigmoid sinus. And junction of that with the internal jugular vein is seen. Now coming to this side, this is middle cranial fossa. Middle cranial fossa is mainly occupied by the spinoid bone. That is greater wing of spinoid bone. Where you have the foramen ovale. Then you have spinosum here. The structures passing through ovale is M-A-L-E, M-A-L. Then you have the spinosum, like I mentioned before, meningeal branch, as well as the middle meningeal artery. And there is a canal, canal that is called innominators. There is nothing that passes through it. Instead of mentioning nothing, we would always say fibrous tissue. And this is a small foramen that is for emissary pain. So this is how it looks. This is how it looks. You have this lacrimal nerve, frontal nerve, trochlear nerve, three nerves. And then you have superior division of oculomotor, nasociliary, inferior division of oculomotor and abducent. So these are the structures that pass through the superior orbital fissure. You can remember this as LFT, left. This is how it looks. You can see the optic canal, the structures, superior division, inferior division of oculomotor. Then you see abducent, nasociliary and the L. F, T, three nerves, you can see in the anterior part. Okay, next coming to the midline structures. Now midline structures here, you can see the muscles that are present above the hyoid, suprahyoid. What is their function? They depress the larynx. Infrahyoid will depress the hyoid bone. So see the difference. That is suprahyoid and this is infrahyoid. So this is 
depressing the hyoid bone that is depressing the larynx. So now you can see there is anterior belly of digastric, posterior belly of digastric, anterior belly is supplied by the nerve to mylohyoid. Nerve to mylohyoid. This is anterior belly. There is posterior belly. Here it is. That is supplied by it goes to the digastric notch. That goes to the digastric notch here. And that is supplied by the facial. Okay. Anterior belly, posterior belly form the boundaries of submandibular triangle. And what do you see here? You can see one more triangle there. And uh, what is the triangle? This triangle is called submental triangle. Submental triangle. It is bounded by the anterior belly on either side and the point where they meet. And there is this hyoid bone. This is the body of the hyoid bone. So it is nowhere related to the mandible. So it's a point where the anterior bellies meet. There was a question where they had asked whether submental triangle has mandible as the boundary. So the answer is no. Okay, next one. There are various fractures in the cranium that we have come across. We know that various fractures in the cranium. You have a depressed fracture here. There are you know, fractures which are classified as comminuted fracture. There could be linear fractures, basilar fracture. Let's see what is the difference between each one of them. Now, in the case of depressed fracture, which is this one, a fragment of the bone is depressed. As you can see, it is depressed here and it can press upon the brain. Okay, that is depressed fracture. Next, in comminuted fracture, which is this one, it is broken down into several pieces. Can you see the pieces of bone? That is broken down into several pieces. Next one, there is linear fracture. This is linear fracture. This is the most frequent. Frequently happening fracture is linear. So what happens here is the bone can be hit on this side and the point of impact is somewhere and the fracture is somewhere else. So the point of impact is somewhere and the fracture is somewhere else. So this can happen in case of this can happen in case of linear calvarial fractures. Now here you can see that there is an impact here. Now it is at the site of impact. This uh, this is marked, and the fracture may occur at some other distance, completely different from that particular bone. So, where the calvaria is thin, it can get fractured there. So, that is linear fracture, which is more frequently happening fracture. Next, there is a another one, counter blow. In counter blows, what happens? The fracture occurs at the opposite end. So, if this is the direction where it is hit, the fracture could be happening on the complete opposite end of the impact. And there are some basilar fractures. Now, this is the norma basalis where, very, where it is very close to the foramen magnum. So the structures which are present through the foramen magnum could get damaged. So that is one important thing to remember. <laughs> now coming to the clinical anatomy, you can see that the, this point is called the terior. Now you have a H-shaped you know, landmark where 
there is frontal bone, spinoid bone, squamous, and parietal. So parietal, frontal, this direction is spinoid, and there is temporal. So all these bones meet at a point called terion. What is so important about the terion? There, the middle meningeal artery divides into anterior and posterior, and the anterior branch lies here. And middle meningeal artery damage could be to extradural myxoma. Next, we'll see some other fractures at the terion. What now? Basilar fracture is something that we saw. Now, here, basilar fracture is important because. The, I mentioned about the foramen magnum. The structures that are present at the foramen magnum can get compressed. That is one thing. And as a result of the fracture, that cerebrospinal fluid can spill out, leading to or leak out, leading to otorrhea. And so now here all other structures that are near the fracture can also get damaged. Now there is another important thing with the terion that is fracture at this point we mentioned that middle meningeal artery and vessels for that matter can get damaged. And then this is an important, you know, landmark also. So, terion and asterions are very important landmarks. Now, you can see this is the meeting point of three bones and this is the meeting of four bones. You can see one here, one here, one from this side, another one from this side. So, you please remember this leads to damage to middle meningeal artery leads to epidural hematoma. So, this can... Definitely press upon the cerebral cortex. So there is this temporal lobe that is what gets damaged. So now this sometimes un when it is not noticed and goes untreated that can also result in the person going into coma and death in a few hours. So you can see there is epidural hemorrhage. This is epidural hemorrhage or epidural um, hematoma arterial. Now here you can see that this is extradural hematoma that you can identify because it is outside the meninges. See you can see the meninges here and it is outside and here is the bone that is the calvaria. Okay. So now here any hard bone, this is the commutated fracture. You can see there is pieces of bone. This is commutated fracture. So now typically the person could have loss of conscious and then with the lucid interval, little bit of uh, you know, break in between a few hours, the person may go into drowsiness, coma and then person may also you know, pass into death. Okay. Now, what about subdural hematoma? That was epidural hematoma. What is subdural? So, when we say subdural, you must remember it is below the dura matter. So, below the dura matter, dura matter has two layers, right? Between these two layers, what is present? There is venous sinuses. The main thing that you can identify is superior sagittal sinus. Like that, there are venous sinuses and these venous sinuses can spill out blood like this into the space that is below the dura mater. So, this is dura mater, one layer and in between them, if there is a damage. So, this can collect in a form which is not, uh, you know, pre-existing space. It can form a space and then it can get collected there. So that's why it will not have a proper shape. But the epidural will have a 
proper crescent shaped this will be the shape of the epidural hematoma but subdural no shape it will take just the shape of whatever pre existing space is present there now you can also see that it is typically involving the veins or venous origin so subdural is venous in origin epidural is middle meningeal artery very very important so now subarachnoid hematoma is also present subarachnoid hematoma is again arterial so a subarachnoid you can see that it is below the arachnoid you know matter and you can see so many thread like extensions they are sac like dilations also you can see that is arachnoid the uh, you know matter or arachnoid granulations you can say it will be sac like extensions and uh, any hemorrhage to this region can result in various meningeal irritations and also headaches stiff neck and then often loss of consciousness so all these symptoms you must remember to identify which hematoma is present okay next moving on to an important term topic on fontanelles a fontanelles there are it is it's also called soft spot right there is one diamond shaped one what is the name of this it is called anterior fontanel now anterior fontanel is this one and this closes when the baby turns 18 to 20 months there is one on the posterior this is about when the baby turns about 3 months of age it closes and this is a fetal skull you can identify the absence of mastoid process you can also see the absence of styloid process you can also see the diameter white parietal diameter by temporal diameter this is about 9.5 and this is about 8.5 so this is the diameter you can see and by this you can identify that it is a fetal skull and you can also see that there are important things associated with that one is it os ossifies by 1 and 1/2 years of age and this one is about 6 to 8 weeks and what are the importance of these fontanel the first and foremost is to it will help to modify its size during the birthing process through the birth canal when it passes it can permit the you know uh, modulation it can slide over each other the parietal either side parietal bones can slide over each other and that can reduce the size of the fetal skull and that way it can pass through the birthing canal and one more thing is you can also gauge the size of the head and then you can relate it to the age of the uh, baby and you can also see that it permits rapid growth of the brain because it it can accommodate the growth of the brain during infancy and also if it is depressed if this spot is depressed the physician can say that the there is uh, he can suggest that it there is dehydration suggest dehydration and if the level is increased or bulged it can result or it can indicate that there is intracranial pressure that is high okay it is increased this suggestions can be gotten by looking at the fontanel and one more important thing is any uh, you know withdraw any blood or any fluid you want to inject into the sinus that can be done through 
Okay, this is how the fontanels look. And one more important thing is all the four corners have the fontanel in case of parietal bone. So parietal bone, the growth starts here or the ossification starts here. And this is called the parietal tuberosity. Okay, so it starts growing in all the four directions. So what happens is by the time the, the pony extension goes up to the anterior fontanel, it takes quite a number of days or months. So it gives appropriate time for the expansion of the brain. The next one, in this picture you can see there is a joints, right? There is occipital bone, there is atlas, axis. This is the second cervical. This is the first cervical. And the joint between these two here is known as Atlanto occipital. You can turn the head in flexion extension. So up and down like this you can nod it and that movement is very important movement as you nod your head, you can say yes. So what is the movement that is produced with Atlanto occipital? Up and down movement, that is yes. Next you have Atlas and Axis. This is between the Atlas and Axis. It is called Atlanto axial joint. And this can do rotatory movement. Like you can uh, nod your head in side to side movements and you can say no. So that is the thing that you can do with the Atlanto axial joint. Next one. This is Atlanto occipital joint. Look at the bean shaped facets. The facets are bean shaped. This is the bean shaped facet. And what is this groove for? Any idea? What is this for? This groove is for vertebral artery. Which part? the third part of the vertebral artery. So you can see the vertebral artery that is third part coming out of the vertebral transverse. You know, you have a foramen transverse area, or you know, this is also a feature of the cervical vertebrae. All the cervical vertebrae have this foramen transverse area where the vertebral artery passes through all the transverse process and then it reaches the first cervical vertebrae and then it enters the foramen magnum. So here, just before entering, it passes over the posterior arch. Let me just quickly name all the parts of this. It has got an anterior arch. It has a posterior arch. And this is foramen transversarium. And you can see the vertebral canal. So this is a groove for the vertebral artery. And you can see that there is a facet here that forms the median Atlanto CL joint with which vertebra that is the dense of the second vertebra that is axis. Okay, so you can see the comparatively the vertebral canal is very big. Why? Because the medulla oblongata also 
you know, um, the end part of the middle oblongata passes through the atlas. So it passes through the foramen magnum and then it passes through that and then it starts tapering down to form the spinal cord. Next, you can see the movements between the first and the second one. So here you have this ligament called apical ligament. And the sides will have alar ligaments. Ala is always sides, okay? Ala, ala of the nose is sides. So alar ligaments are present. And there is transverse ligament, which is a very, very important ligament. That is the one which keeps the joint stable. So if someone asks you which one keeps the joint stable, is transverse ligament. Usually the subluxation or dislocation of this particular joint does not happen because of the apical ligament. So the apical ligament is quite strong in keeping the, the dense part hooked on or stay put to the arch of the atlas. Even though the transverse ligament may break, but it will still stay in place and prevent subluxation. So usually that does not happen. It happens only if the subluxation happens only when there is a fracture. Not if the transverse ligament is injured. So if there is a fracture like hanging, in hanging or strangulation, only then the tens or the odontoid process may break and that results in subluxation. So this is how it looks. <clears throat> you can see the bean shaped. This is for occipital condyles, which goes up. This is the dense. Okay, so this is the spine. This is the bifid spine. This is foramen transverse area. This is the posterior arch where you can see the vertebral artery related. The third part of the vertebral artery. So now here what is absent in the first one? In the atlanto odontoid joint is this one. That is median joint. This is. There are two lateral and one median between the first and the second cervical vertebrae, which you can see. So this is atlanto axial joint. So this is how the alar ligaments are present, the apical ligament, the alar ligament, and you can also see the lateral atlanto axial joint. Then you can also see the median atlanto axial joints. So these are the alar ligaments which are present on either side. And what are these joints? Any idea between the pedicles? What is this joint? These are called zygapo. Zygapophysial joints. These are these are called zygapophysial joints. Next one, you can see that the membrana tectoria extends. So this red thing, what you can see is membrana tectoria. So you can see the membrana tectoria. That's an upward extension that you can see from the that is the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament. So, you, anybody can ask you, membrana tectoria is an extension of what? It's an extension of posterior longitudinal ligament. So, just before it forms the spine. So, this will be the spine. And uh, before it forms the spine, you can see this is the 
membrana tectoria. This is on the posterior aspect. And you can see that it broadens as it goes upwards. The width is getting more and more as it goes upwards. And then it is attached to the body of the axis. Before it goes up to the axis, it is very, very broad. And this is what you know, uh, it will be continuous as the dura mater. So, membrana tectoria is a very important structure which also passes through foramen magnum. What does it become? It, it just merges with dura mater. So it connects all the dura matter from the cranial cavity connected with the spinal cord. So it is not a separate thing. It is just merging with the uh, posterior aspect of the, the vertebral canal. So that way it keeps all the vertebral bodies aligned in a line. So that is its uh, job. Next one you can see the cervical vertebrae. There are one to seven. There are 12 thoracic, you have 5 lumbar, you have uh, sacrum and the coccyx. So this one is cervical, you have the curvatures. Okay, lumbar vertebrae, what is the usual thing that we have heard? Lordosis. Defects in the spine. We have heard of lordosis, that is exaggerated, exaggerated lumbar curvature is lordosis, where the abdomen is pushed forward, it is pushed forward. So, there is more and more exaggeration at the posterior aspect. Then you can see the thoracic and cervical as well. The thoracic is for humpback or kyphosis. So kyphosis, lordosis, you can see. And if it involves all the vertebrae. And there are several degrees. You can call them as scoliosis. Scoliosis. So kyphosis, lordosis and scoliosis. So all these are involved with which type of Curvature. Is it primary or secondary? Which one? Primary or secondary? It is involved with the it is involved with the secondary. It's always involved with secondary. See, remember, secondary is something that is produced or it the curvature forms after birth. No, the cervical curvature comes when baby starts, you know, lifting up his head, supporting its head and moving the head right and left. And the lumbar curvature, lumbar curvature, when does the baby get? Lumbar curvature, cervical and lumbar. Lumbar is when baby starts walking. Cervical is when lifting head. And the baby's head and neck is supported. That is when its cervical curvature is perfectly aligned. When the baby starts walking on his feet, lumbar curvature can support it. These are all secondary curvatures. So it can, it can, there is a possibility that it can get easily, you know, defected. Okay, thank you so much for all this, uh, you know, beautiful comments. And um, it's really, uh, you know, it really matters to me. And I also want to thank all those who have dedicated the red hat and uh, brown hat. I'm very, very thankful to you. Keep watching an academy platform classes and lectures. And we have various things that is lined up for you. Go for subscription. Get your 100% coverage with all the topics. And um, yes, thank you. We have um, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have, uh, who else is appreciating? Thank you so much. Rishabh, thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Risha. All right. Next, you have this picture where you can see the thoracic curvature. Okay, there is a concavity here. There is a convexity here. This is convex. This is concave. This is known as kyphosis. It is also called humpback. So excessive thoracic kyphosis. This is called, there is abnormal increase in the thoracic curvature. So now here it curves posteriorly. As you can see, it curves posteriorly. So there is another one that you can think of that is called dowager hump. Okay. This is again, it is excessive part of kyphosis. This is just a you know, small degree of kyphosis, but exaggerated kyphosis is called dowager hump that is seen in very old women where the generic people, they are oh, very old uh, geriatric, uh, you know, patients and um, uh, people of both the sexes can have this condition where there is excessive concavity in the thoracic curvature. You can see lordosis. You can also see this pit. There is a hollow back. Okay. So now the trunk muscles are very weak in this case. Especially the anterior ab muscles. This can happen usually, you know, during pregnancy. Or it can happen even after pregnancy if the lady has undergone a C-section. These are the chances of getting this lordosis condition. So scoliosis, this is I mentioned, dovaja. This is the scoliosis. This is the normal. So usually the, you know, girls with the pubertal age between 12 to 15 are the ones who do know sometimes when they don't take sufficient calcium in their diet, they can also develop these defects in the vertebral column. So that is, again, there are so many, um, you know, conditions where there is a problem with the intrinsic muscles of the back that is myopathic scoliosis or it could be because of the hemi vertebrae. The vertebrae may not be covering the spinal cord completely. That could also be there. And also sometimes there could be difference in the length of their lower limbs. One could be taller, one could be you know, shorter. That can also result in scoliosis. So we'll discuss all this in detail. Why the limb length could be shorter? We'll discuss this. Okay, coming to the next one. We have uh, paranasal air sinuses here. If you can observe, there is paranasal air sinuses. All these air sinuses, they open into important, you know, uh, things. That is the sphenoidal air sinus opens into spinoethmoidal recess. That is here. This is the superior concha. This is the middle concha. This is the inferior nasal concha. This is spinoethmoidal recess. Then just beneath the middle concha, you have a bulla that is called ethmoidal bulla. And underneath you have a hiatus semilunaris where the three things open. One is the ethmoidal air sinus and frontal air sinus and maxillary air sinus. Here will be ethmoidal maxillary and frontal. Which ethmoidal? There is anterior group, middle and the posterior. The anterior and the middle ones. But where does the posterior one open into? It opens into superior hiatus. And there is this inferior concha. This is the inferior concha. 
here underneath you have an opening of nasolacrimal duct. So these are the openings in the lateral wall of the nose. Those for paranasal air sinuses. You have also have the opening of the auditory tube. Here you can see the, in this section you can see, this is the soft palate. You can see frontal air sinus. This is the sphenoidal air sinus and you can also see the fossa for the pituitary. All that you can identify in this particular section. So with all this, I would like to stop here at this point. This is part one. Part two, that is continuation of the same thing. So part, in, part two, it will be continued. And that is at 10 p.m. tonight. So please join in again at 10 p.m. for the second half of the clinical aspects that you can list or any quick revision of the head and neck portion we will do at 10 p.m. Please join in. I have a lot of clinical aspects also to discuss with. We just started with the part one and part two will have a lot of clinical aspects also. So join in at 10 p.m. same on YouTube. My name is Dr. Ruini. So, he's signing off. Use the code ROHINI to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.